So now uh, we're going to start the entertainment portion of this uh, this afternoon's festivities. I believe Dean Laws is going to be all the right known as Laura to many of you. Uh, who's going to start things off? Thank you, James. I, I promised to try my Dean voice, but I didn't think I could get over the crowd. So I want to thank you all for joining us to dedicate this new CICS makerspace to Professor Robin Popplestone. Many of you actually had the pleasure of working and collaborating with Robin and remember him as a dear friend and colleague. I unfortunately did not know him. Um, so I'm going to keep my part as short as I can and let you guys all tell the stories. What I can tell you, because I know of him, is that Robin John Popplestone was one of the early pioneers in robotics and computer programming languages. He's been described as a modest, sometimes touch-centric, with flashes of genius. You'll see pictures of him up on the, on the walls there. I'll tell you one story, you guys are responsible for the rest. This is apparently a well-known story, <laughs> that while Robin was studying for a PhD in England, his project was to program a computer to prove logic theorems. He did that. But his creativity got the upper hand over the tedium of writing up the thesis, so they neglected the thesis, <laughs> and instead used the university computer to design a boat, a very early example of computer-aided design. He went on to build the boat, set sail for Edinburgh, where he was going to start his career. He'd been offered a research fellowship. In the North Sea, a storm broke. Robin was rescued and taken aboard a passing ship but his boat, alas, went to bottom. A myth persisted that the boat contained a draft of his PhD thesis. <laughs> but I'm assured that was not the case. <laughs> okay, he started his career in Edinburgh, and by 1972, he was a member of a small team that developed a hand-eye robotic device that could assemble some simple models, a toy, boat, and car from a few pieces. The system was trained to recognize the pieces visually, and then if you dumped the pieces on the table, the system separated them and assembled them together to make the model. Rod Rupert, our own wonderful robotics uh, senior professor today, uh, has discovered footage of the, of, the, of the robot, which you can see behind those guys in the room over there. So not right now, but you go look at it uh, later. <coughs> the robot was called Freddy II and is in the collection of the Museum of Scotland. Robin continued to do visionary work in robotics involving the integration of multimodal sensing, vision, etc., um, into robotic control and the development of techniques for modeling and of and spatial reasoning about geometric objects. He established and led one of the first world-class robotics research groups in Europe. But of course, we're dedicating the space here. That's because in 1985, Robin joined our faculty as a professor of computer science and director of our laboratory for perceptual robotics. With his students, he advanced group theoretical frameworks for describing relationships between bodies and describing symmetries and tasks that could be exploited by control and planning. In 1990, Robin was selected as a founding fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence <coughs> in recognition of his seminal contributions. Robin returned to Glasgow to be near his family in the sea in 2001. He and his wife, Kristen Morrison, professor of English at Boston College, spent a great deal of time sailing, including a year and a half when they lived on his boat, sailing around Scotland, Ireland, Sweden, and Denmark. Robin sailed until the final year of his life. He unfortunately died from cancer in 2000. In 2006, Kristen Morrison established the Robin Popplestone Fellowship in Robotics and Artificial Intelligence in what was then the Department of Computer Science. Kristen has been a loyal and generous friend to computer science and takes great pleasure in learning about each new Popplestone Fellow's talent, research, and aspirations. Last year, Kristen arranged a generous request to the fellowship our first request in the college, which one day will enable the fellowship to provide approximately $35,000 each year in support of a PhD student. So with this dedication, we wish to honor Robin's impact on our department and the field of computer science, 
and Kristen's dedication to ensuring that Robin's legacy will continue to help talented computer science graduate students in perpetuity. We hope that Robin's playfulness and joy in creating extends to all of the students who will use this new makerspace. To Robin Hopkins. So Robin was a well, one of a kind. I don't think there's another person like that. Um, I have so many stories that I don't think are appropriate. Um, no, I'll, I'll amend a few of the other ones that were watered down. Um, I first met Robin in 1988 when I joined the department. Um, he, uh, shortly after I arrived, he turned 50 at a 50th birthday party. He had it at his house and he invited me to my family. Um, during the party, he regaled us with his favorite piece of literature, Winnie the Pooh. He read several passages from it. I just wanted to uh, explain why maybe Winnie the Pooh was so important to Robin. Um, and to A. A. Milne wrote Winnie the Pooh in Britain between World War I and World War II. And one of the reasons that he said he wrote the books was to uplift and encourage hopefulness in the young generation of people who are being bombed all the time. Uh, Robin explained to me several times that when he, he was young in Bristol, and maybe in London, I don't know how the story goes, but I know he lived in Bristol. At any rate, he told me many times he had to run to the bomb shelter in the middle of the night and wait there until morning while uh, they got bombed to oblivion. Um, and so I think he was just about that age that A.A. A. A. Milne was trying to address, and uh, his name was Rob. Uh, so um, he really loved that book. He said it was not written for children, actually. It was written for adults. Um, uh, also at that party, he took me downstairs uh, with my two toddlers at the time, who are now bigger than me. Um, and he spent part of the evening entertaining them down there with his model train set, which I'm going to come back to a little bit later um, when we talk about the history of the embedded systems. Um, so you heard all the specifics. You know his resume. Um, you know about the sailboat. I'm going to um, embellish it. Um, I was at Edinburgh and I visited with his old colleagues and everybody, and they. They told me all stories that Robin uh, denied ever happened. <laughs> the one, the most hyperbolic story I heard, uh, heard related to the sailboat uh, episode. And the story as they told me, and Robin denied it, um, and it can't be true. As it turned out, I found out that it must be false. So I take this as a part of the legend of Robin, Robin <laughs> um, that he actually um, threw a rugby ball and his dissertation into a knapsack and started kicking the shore. Now we know that he was picked up by a boat, at least that's what the mainstream media says. <laughs> he got to the shore, he ran to the dean's office and tried to present his dissertation, <laughs> dripping wet, and found out that he had plugged the wrong document into his knapsack, and then it, and so it went down to the bottom. Either way you look at it, it went to the bottom. Um, Okay, so um, I'll go through a little bit of his research that wasn't touched on in the previous comments. Um, POP2 was, of course, that was one of the most famous AI programming languages in Europe at the time, and specifically in the UK, was used quite extensively. Um, let's see, when he, before he left here, retired, he was up to POP11 instead of POP2. So he still maintained it all those years. Um, he, um, Worked early work at Edinburgh, I believe, with Donald Mickey, who many of you may know. He was a pioneer in tilde ML. I don't think it was called ML back then, it was called something else, and control for robotics. And um, they both wrote uh, influential papers on memoization, that is the combining of search and memory to make things more efficient and uh, make bandwidth go up in robot controllers. Um, in the conclusion of Robin's paper, he said something about uh, um, kind of uh, interpolating between data points in these models and using that as a means of estimating what the memory would contain, kind of anticipating the current kind of hot uh, areas in um, deep learning and RL today. Um, 
We already talked about Freddy, the movie's in here, you should check it out. Freddy, we're still doing what Freddy did. What year was that? 1972. <laughs> um, and it's, so it stands up, even to the state of the art today, it's doing some things that are really beyond our general understanding of how to do them um, in a, in a, in a you know, narrower context, but it still worked. Um, one of the things that Robin loved to talk about was his milk float. Do you remember his milk float? It was a four-ton milk truck um, that was ahead of its time. It was an electric uh, vehicle. It weighed four tons. He said it wouldn't go very fast, but it had tons of torque. And so he could push people up snowy mountains with his milk load. He was also a crusader against automobiles. He, he um, treated them as if they were a, a public health issue. And they are. They're up there amongst the highest number of killers. Uh, people are killed in automobile accidents. And right up there with the worst diseases we have. Um, but he crusaded against that for a long time. Never owned, never owned a, a car while here at UMass. Although he found that UMass preserves a blue law, which says that if you ride your horse to school, the, the stable over here is required to groom and feed them before you ride them home. <laughs> and so, um, he was shopping in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for an old Amish horse he could have to ride from South Amherst into campus every day. And I don't think he ever came up with the right horse. Um, Okay, so he moved to UMass in uh, 1985 and directed the LPR I, that I now direct. Um, we talked about the group theoretic and the symmetry work, and also that he was a, a founding fellow of the AAAI. Um, so I think I'll skip some of that stuff. Um, but I want to get back to the train set. So I'm going to conclude by talking about the train sets a little bit. Um, I don't know the exact year. I think it was around 1994. Robin and I commiserated over the lack of physical sciences that CS people uh, take typically in their curriculum and the fact that they didn't have physical insight and intuition into the problems they were solving, especially if they were embedded systems. So that's when Robin in, um, founded the Embedded Systems Lab. That lab is taught a class last semester. Um, when Robin did it, um, he and his students built a model train set. Robin uh, donated all the trains and they put up some tracks and they had to put an embedded controller in that would switch the tracks so that the multiple trains that were on the track system wouldn't run into each other. Um, so they built the track switches and all the lights and they built scenery and they did it up and then they would run three or four trains around on the same train track and they would miss each other by inches and everybody was <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> um, that teaching laboratory has been um, in service ever since. Uh, as I said, uh, last semester we taught a, um, the same course with the same kind of curriculum, but using self-driving cars. It seems like we've gone full circle here, <laughs> except Robin hated cars, so I don't know if maybe we'll have to get rid of those and put some trains in there. Um, you know, so he was a very unique person. With lots of stories, lots of warm memories I have of Robin and all the quirky things he used to do. But in closing, I just wanted to say that um, given his, his leadership in embedded systems 15 years before makerspaces were a thing, um, and uh, I think it's very fitting and appropriate that we recognize Robin's distinctive presence while he was here at UMass and acknowledge the many contributions he made to our community, still some of them ahead of their time, um, that Robin brought a, a, to us here at UMass uh, through this dedication of this makerspace to Robin. And so I think it's a very fitting tribute to a very unique person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll speak from here because in a moment I want to uh, bring my laptop and show some pictures and videos. But I've been asked to speak a few words about the MAKE course, uh, which is a new course that I have taught last year uh, for two times. Uh, so this course is officially uh, it's called uh, CICS 290M MAKE, uh, and its official name is uh, Introduction, Hands-On Introduction to Physical Computing. So there are many inspirations for creating this course. Uh, one of them is the recent maker movement. And in case you have any doubts about this term maker, it means people who make 
the do-it-yourself or DIYers. Uh, the spirit is that instead of buying products off the shelf, maybe we should try to invent and make products ourselves. And then in the process of making, uh, you know, we can learn about how modern gadgets, electronics work, and it's a great learning experience. Um, so this course I've taught twice, uh, it covers the basics of electronics, uh, embedded programming using uh, Arduino microcontroller, sensors, motors, uh, 3D printing, you know, laser cutting, uh, rapid prototyping, uh, and it ends with a final project, which in a moment I'll show you some pictures and videos. Uh, they're really exciting, creative final projects. Now, the reason I mentioned this is, this is one of the cor many courses that will benefit significantly from having a modern makerspace like this one. Uh, so the, the, the two times I taught the course, it was managed in uh, Computer Science 1, 142, and uh, that was not a proper lab space. And this course has a lab section, so there, there are labs which we have to do, students have to do the soldering exercise, you know, circuit assembly. So we have to move all the tools down to 142 and remove them afterwards, which I'm sure Alex here, who has been TA for the course, can tell you all about how painful that is. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, next time I teach it, this space will be fully ready and uh, it will benefit significantly from having access to all the modern tools that, you know, we don't have to move soldering irons around. Uh, so the basic requirement for the final project is that it has to involve building hardware, generally electronics, and sometimes it looks more like a robotics project, and then also they have to write software to control the hardware. So these are some pictures, I, some photo, videos I took in the spring semester last year, and one of the most impressive projects is this 8x8x8 uh, eight by eight by eight color LED cube. Uh, which it's really hard to describe how stunning it looks like just by picture. You have to see it in person because this thing just radiates lights at you. Uh, and it, you know, they, these are also two students who took intro graphics, uh, and so they wrote all sorts of fancy graphics algorithms uh, to display all kinds of visual patterns. So this is like really, really cool project. Uh, and then there is a, a smart mirror that, uh, this is a student who built a smart mirror with a Raspberry Pi and then Arduino, uh, you know, controlling the, the display pattern. This is the back of the, and then you can see the front. So this is really a mirror, but with an embedded display behind the mirror. So you can see weather information, news, and it also has, uh, you know, time, and uh, uh, color LED ring. Uh, in fact, after the projects, I always encourage students to think about commercializing, maybe polishing their project projects and then making it maybe a commercial product. Uh, and you know, some of them are, are quite interested. So one of them is this project. It's a tileable color LED display that you can link these uh, display tiles together into a custom shaped display and then there will be a cell phone app that uh, controls the display pattern um, and so this is one of the students who is uh, going to launch a Kickstarter campaign about this project and uh, there is a dog feeder project, a smart dog feeder but I think the highlight of this party is really the dog. That's the dog. And everyone was asking, is this the project? Is the dog the project? But uh, it's a smart dog feeder that you can monitor the uh, your your pet, and then also you can remotely using your cell phone release uh, you know food, pet food. In fact, it has a weight sensor that can can you know sense how much dog food there is, uh, and Just like you know so that your pet won't overeat. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I'll show some of the projects of this past semester in the spring, uh, sorry, the fall semester. Probably one of the most impressive, uh, I mean, in, in my opinion, is uh, this uh, hoop bot, this one. So it's kind of a little robotics project. So they build a platform, a rotating platform with a ping pong ball and a solenoid that can shoot the ping pong ball. So the idea is that you, as a player, can place a hoop somewhere around it, and then it's going to automatically identify where the hoop is, and then shoot the ping pong ball 
uh, to into the, the group. So this is a like technical way, quite challenging because they have to figure out how to build this platform and how to make the automotor and the, the solenoid uh, mm. to work uh, with high voltage. So, uh, but the end result was quite successful. Uh, we actually, you know, identified the group fairly, so you can see that <laughs> on the there. Uh, and then this is one of the like pretty artistic projects. Uh, but as our yes, even here. So he's uh, the lead member who built this. Uh, this is a, a how would you describe like a one meter by one meter size color. Yeah. So again, you know, this is a really stunning when you look at it physically. I mean, this is the one thing about physical uh, objects is that it's hard to describe it, but when you look at it, you know, it really looks incredible. It's just a visual way, really stunning, uh, a color display. Oh, show the game of life one. What? The game of life is to the left. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is the game of life. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is really the get to combine all the knowledge that they learned uh, through the class and then uh, trying to demonstrate that. Um, well, in any case, so, so um, I don't want to take too much time, but I'm just uh, uh, here to see that, you know, really, uh, this is one of the courses that will benefit a lot from having a maker space, and I'm, I'm really, really happy that uh, the space is, is now ready, and, uh, you know, so next time I teach it, uh, it, will, it will be great, so we'll have access to all the tools. Thanks.